I am sandwiched between two eminent interpreters of Teilhard. It's a, it's a uh, daunting task. Um, I'm not myself a scholar of Teilhard technically. I think his thought is extremely important. Terence Deacon asked me to present on Teilhard's reception in the Catholic Church. And I just got stuck on Pope Francis. So I'm gonna present on Teilhard and Pope Francis today. So I'm going to be doing a reading of an important aspect of Teilhard's thinking on the noosphere through the lens of an important aspect of Pope Francis's teaching. My concern is to get a better understanding of humanity in relation to the world in the context of our ecological crisis. So with this concern in mind, the aspect of Pope Francis's teaching I shall focus on is his distinction between polarity and polarization as found in his, in his encyclical on the environment, Laudato Si. So these two Jesuits that I'm focusing on today, Pope Francis and Teilhard, are both thinkers, I would contend, of dialectical polarity. And I'm drawing on lots of sources for Teilhard on this who've established this claim. Reading Teilhard through Pope Francis helps to bring out this polarity dimension in his thinking. This talk has two broad sections. The first will be on Pope Francis on the interconnectivity of all things through polar differentiation. And the second section will be on how Teilhard's philosophy of time helps to develop Teilhard or Pope Francis's concern to see the world in terms of relationality, affirming thereby humankind's need to aspire for a relationship to the world that is a more harmonious unity, a symphonic unity, if you will. So the unity and polarity understanding helps to envision possibilities for future action that are less threat threatening to the viability of our continued existence in the cosmos than approaches that view the noosphere in polarized fashion in relation to the universe seen as a purely objective other fit for little more than to be put on the rack and tortured for its secrets so that humankind can extend the limits of its dominion. And if Francis Bacon himself did not in fact speak those words, they are indicative of an attitude that has been prevalent. So first I begin with Pope Francis and polarity in Laudato Si. John Hott, the next speaker, has himself noted, a, and in several books on Teilhard, has noted a parallel between Pope Francis and Teilhard in his most recent book on Teilhard's cosmic vision. Each theologian refuses to bifurcate modern religious concern with individual salvation from the concern for the destiny of the universe as such. In the case of Pope Francis, concern for the universe requires humanity to overcome the friend-enemy dialectic between humanity and the non-human other that has, in his view, tended to dominate the modern age. So I have a book up here on the screen by a political theorist who promotes a friend-enemy dialectic that is at present encouraging a kind of fragmentation in our world. And Pope Francis comes from an Argentinian theological school that quite consciously is proposing an alternative to this in politics, but then Pope Francis applies this different kind of dialectical understanding to the human and non-human or the human other. And here's a quote from Laudato Si. We need to develop a new synthesis capable of overcoming the false dialectics of recent centuries. And the, the official English translation translates dialecticos arguments. It should be dialectics. Translating it arguments tends to mute the force of Pope Francis's thinking on polarity versus polarization in the encyclical. Other translations have the correct translation. So Pope Francis is indeed a thinker of dialectical polarity and polar unity. And he follows in this regard a tradition of Jesuit reflection that stems from interpretation of St. Ignatius of Loyola's spiritual exercises. This book here was extremely influential in Pope Francis's formation. There's a whole Jesuit tradition that surely Teilhard himself takes part in to some extent of 
the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius of Loyola that lead them, read them in terms of dialectical polarity. But the notion of polarity in Pope Francis's thought has resonance with wider currents of modern thought with, with which he is familiar, like romantic and idealist traditions for which the quest for unity was of paramount concern. These traditions sought to discover the deeper wholeness and unity that underlies all things. The exclusions and divisions of mechanistic materialism were thought by these thinkers to be ultimately superficial and delusory, and they aspired to develop a new approach. But the unity they sought for did not necessarily entail the eclipse of differences. For Samuel Taylor Coleridge, for instance, unity was realized precisely in and through multiety or multiplicity. One of Coleridge's keys to understanding the true meaning of unity was indeed polarity. He says, every power in nature and in spirit must evolve an opposite as the sole means and condition of its manifestation. And all opposition is a tendency to reunion. This is the universal law of polarity. Coleridge, as with the esoteric theosophical tradition with which early modern science was deeply intertwined, understood polarity in part in terms of the unity of opposite poles in a magnetic field. Unity in this sense refers to harmony and cooperation. Polar unity does not refer to poles that are antagonistic and hostile to one another. The antagonistic construct of relationality refers to polarization, which is, of course, one of the most widespread topics of discussion in our culture today, and it seems to me self-evidently important for any discussion concerning the noosphere. So the antagonistic construct of relationality is polarization, a more har harmonious sense of unity of things is polarity in this tradition. And though Pope Francis draws directly from Jesuit theologians in distinguishing polarity from polarization, his thought is very much in accordance with romantic poets or idealist philosophers. And I couldn't help but think of some connection here when the question was raised about Hegel in the last session. However, Pope Francis' understanding of polar unity is precisely what I have just described in Coleridge. He's not really using the romantics, but he's describing the kind of thing that they described. Unity, he insists, does not mean doing away with differentiation. It has to do with harmonious interconnectivity of the poles. Pope Francis has been insistently calling the Catholic Church, all Christians, all religions, anyone who will listen to him, usually not in the Catholic Church, to come together in unity in and through differences. He uses a precise image to describe the real unity toward which we are all called the differentiated unity of a polyhedron as opposed to that of a sphere. It is unity through relationality and interconnectivity that perfects the terms of the relations. Interconnectivity and relationality are persistent themes in Laudato Si, understood precisely in terms of polarity. The current pope understands humankind in relation to the non-human world in these terms. He strongly critiques what he considers to be false and destructive polarization between humanity and nature that has characterized the modern age, in no small part due to bad interpretations of Christian thought coming from Christians themselves. He insists that humankind possesses an imperative to overcome this polarization and to establish a harmonious polar unity with planet Earth. This imperative, it should be noted, includes recognition of human uniqueness. I think Italian theologian Massimo Borghese is correct to say that Laudato Si is a deeply humanistic text. However, he is at the same time strongly critical of false versions of anthropocentrism, but he does not, for all that, then counsel biocentrism. He encourages instead envisioning our relationship to the cosmos more as an I-thou relationship rather than as purely subject-object relationality. Polarity between the human and non-human is maintained in and through difference by way of a more adequate theology, philosophy, and spirituality of relationality 
which the Pope associates directly in the text of Laudato Si with the science of open systems. And he may have got that from Terence Deacon, at least indirectly. Uh, Terence has a story about this, by the way. So moving to the higher vista of polarity and relationality beyond polarization, we would no longer pit ourselves against the world as if we were necessarily involved in an antagonistic subject versus object confrontation. Pope Francis says that human beings endowed with intelligence and love and drawn by the fullness of Christ are called to lead all creatures back to their creator. So I have a text from Laudato Si here, and this is the text where Teilhard is referenced in a papal encyclical, positively, not condemned as a heretic. And this is quite a development in Catholic theology. Although it should be said, all the post conciliar popes have had good things to say about Teilhard. And the noosphere concept is especially important for Pope Benedict XVI in his pre-papal writings. But I want to turn to Teilhard himself now. So the second thing, polarity as it's manifested in how Teilhard thinks about time. So there are scholars who have shown that Teilhard thought in terms of polar dialectics. Several polar relationalities frame the contentions that he makes with respect to the noosphere and its development. For instance, the within or without of things, material and spirit, or most importantly for what I'm talking about today, humanity and the universe at large. Teilhard sets these polarities in the context of a durational vision of cosmic genesis as an eventual convergence toward unity through the perfected consciousness of humankind realized at the culmination of the omega point of history. This contextualization enables him to show forth the meaningful interconnectivity of the universe with creative union, which is the whole point of the universe for Teilhard realized spatio-temporally in and through the leading shoot of its evolutionary advance, which he understands to be humankind itself in so many of his writings. But what more precisely is the relationship between humankind and the world in this process for Teilhard, and does it measure up to Pope Francis's insistent plea for the establishment of polar and harmonious unity between humankind and the universe as such? Certainly the desire to articulate the meaning and reality of interconnectivity that is common to both Teilhard and Pope Francis can be more fully realized if we do not simply focus on the synchronically instantiated ordering of the world, but direct our attention to the complex of interpenetrating webs of relationalities that are enabled by diachronic determinations and processes. All things in the physical universe are deeply intertwined not only because there are non-local interactions between elements across space in instantaneously realized entanglements, according to some interpretations of quantum physics, these entanglements are formed together by a common history through a shared trajectory of time that embraces the spatiality and materiality of the universe in a conic movement toward ultimate convergence. I refer here to Teilhard's notion of the temporal grounding of relationality in Genèse. This approach establishes that the entire universe is constituted by a unified process through successive stages, moving toward a single unifying end made present in the transhuman or ultra-human figure of Christ for Teilhard. So you have ultimately Christogenesis, and that gives you a kind of rough sort of picture of the cone of time as he describes it in various writings, including in The Future of Man. One reason Teilhard is an important thinker is precisely because he saw with special clarity and depth the importance for human thought of the modern discovery of the interconnectivity of all things that is entailed by our new sense of time from physics and evolutionary biology and what that discovery entails regarding humanity in relation to the cosmos as well as the significance of human action to cosmic destiny, the convulsions of our age, he insisted, result precisely from our discovery of time in the modern sense. We have developed over the past two or three centuries a new understanding of the temporality of the world. We see that we are not simply thrown into a spatial 
expanse whose various elements are indifferently and arbitrarily collected together so that the presence of any particular element precisely in its spatio-temporal particularity would be of no intrinsic concern to all the others. The course of the universe in time makes us realize that it is not capable of locally circumscribed alterations effected arbitrarily through displacements or removals of objects. An example he uses is Socrates and Descartes. You, they couldn't change places with one another. They are temporally constituted as who they are. Such changes would induce impact on the totality of space-time that would have an unraveling effect. Bringing the dimension of time into our thinking enables a better grasp of how everything belongs together in an intrinsically relational bond and gives a broader perspective on the consequences of our actions in local environments. Teilhard delineates three fundamental characteristics of temporal development as we now know it that I think are of particular consequence. The first is that every constitutive element of the world emerges from some prior reality. Each particle of existence extends from the previous fragment to the next in an indivisible thread running back into infinity. The second, is that the threads of elements thus formed are not extensively homogeneous, but represent in each stage a naturally ordered series in which the links can no more be exchanged than can the successive states of infancy, adolescence, maturity, and senility in our own lives. And the third is that there is no individual thread of succession in the universe that is wholly independent of the surrounding threads. These threads each together form a sheaf, which itself exists within a larger sheaf in a kind of concentric layering that continues on indefinitely. Time incorporates space into itself so that the two are integrated into a common progression in which space represents a momentary section of the flow which is endowed with depth and coherence by time. This philosophy of time helps us to understand more deeply one of Pope Francis's governing axioms, time is greater than space. He says that if we initiate processes, we can overcome spatial divisions, but I think this can have a kind of cosmic construal beyond what Pope Francis explicitly says. The universe then is an interconnected whole of lines of impact, spatially intertwined, ranging from the realm of the immense to that of the infinitesimal, and temporally intertwined, ranging from the abyss of the past to the abyss of the future. Of course, this spatial-temporal intertwining is for Teilhard a progress of evolutionary mutation, the cosmos itself being a big history. This big history moves in accordance with a law of increasing integrated complexity of elements and developed and developing organisms from which increasing levels of consciousness emerge until at length we reach the level of the human phenomenon, which represents a decisive mutation from zero to everything, as he once put it. Humanity's singularly organized and unified physical chemical complexity as the ultimate product of evolution brings forth with this emergence a qualitatively unique development, a mutually reciprocating interplay of self-consciousnesses, of centers of self-reflection and personal movement, of self-determination, Humankind is phenomenologically distinguished from other species, first and foremost by the intensive centering of its being. Time and interconnectivity then have to do with the conic topology of evolutionary advance reaching to the human level as humankind assumes the responsibility that should accrue to it, leading the universe toward the end through the higher stages of love that Ilya Delia was talking about to the final convergence of all things. Which brings me then to my final section here. So <clears throat> for Teilhard, as for Pope Francis, interconnectivity does not entail the elimination of difference. The process of genèse for Teilhard is not homogeneous but analogous, involving emergence there is an analogy of duration, and Teilhard himself speaks in this manner. In traditional notions of analogy, you have 
the being of the universe understood in terms of similarities and differences on different levels of hierarchically stratified realms. And Teilhard kind of inverts that to a historical perspective, an evolutionary perspective. But the book that I have on the screen is probably the most famous and important book on the traditional understanding of analogy, but articulated post-German idealism by Eric Schwara, another Jesuit who influenced Pope Francis. But Teilhard doesn't just repeat this old analogical understanding. And if you've read any of John Hott's books, you know, he, he says that we gotta get beyond analogy, but the analogy that he describes is not what I'm going to be describing here with Teilhard. Because Teilhard transposes the pre-modern analogical construal of, of the world to the time dimension of the evolutionary understanding of modernity. So he proposes a dynamic analogy in which there is similarity and difference precisely with orientation to continuity and discontinuity in the historical processes of continuing creation, recognition of which enables us to protect difference and unity in the conic path of cosmogenesis that leads ultimately to the culmination of the unity of the universe. So difference and continuity are understood as sort of the replacement for similarity, or continuity and discontinuity are the sort of replacement for similarity and dissimilarity in the older uh, vertical analogical understanding of things. But you still have similarity and difference working with Teilhard in a very emergent, emergentistic kind of understanding. Teilhard himself compared his understanding of analogy to the scholastic concept of being, and he says this, he says, what he talks about, what I've just been describing, he said this himself, I'm quoting it from one of his great scholars, Henri de Lubac, who wrote five books on Teilhard. It is the ancient scholastic truth, but rejuvenated in the light of duration. So everything is related precisely through a genetic and dynamic movement of things on the basis of pre-existing analogous. There are histories within an overarching total history of the cosmos. The plurality of histories is distinct, but interdependent, correspondent, and interactive. The processes of transformation that mark the genesis of the universe in its different stages, keep going back to this classic sort of diagram, work in accordance with profound likenesses and ever greater differences through the mutual development of species and the higher formations of complexity consciousness as all things are moving and moved toward unity in which differentiation is perfected rather than abolished. So what Ilya was talking about, you have the personalization of the universe. So the realities emergent in distinct stages of the universe are irreducible to earlier stages. This unity and duality creates a dialectical tension between the levels or stages, but the point of the dialectic is ultimately to enable polar unity, unification that personalizes rather than individualizes. That's a distinction Teilhard himself makes, personalization rather than individualization. That centers and harmonizes rather than disperses in antagonistic disconnection or collapses onto a level of homogeneous Univocity. Univocity is different than analogy. It's about everything just being undifferentiatedly united. And that's not how Teilhard is seeing the convergence of the universe through history and time. So the ultimate unity toward which all things are moving in the evolutionary universe is a center to center unity through which the deepening of consciousness and consciousness is, is enabled a radial unity, the unity of the within. The drops of the ocean all have their consciousness in this perfected unity of creation or of the universe. It is true, however, that the center to center unity that Teilhard envisions in its final eschatological form is sometimes taken by commentators and scholars of his work to refer only to human individual beings, human persons, in their love for one another in the body of Christ for Teilhard. But what of the non-human world in this? Some insist that he holds that the final termination of history, when Noah Genesis reaches its culmination, 
In Christogenesis, the material world will be jettisoned. I'm not sure if this is the correct interpretation of Teilhard. It could be that he means that in the end, this final unification of all things will be a perfection that we can't anticipate, or if it is, a, it's not even a static thing, I don't think, for him. But he has been criticized. John Hott notes, notes this in his recent book on Teilhard. He's been criticized for both ignoring and contributing to the ecological crisis. And if his eschatological vision is something along the lines of what some commentators have said, where there's this jettisoning, jettisoning of matter, I could see how that might encourage a kind of instrumentalization with respect to the world. But I don't think that's the proper interpretation in the end of Teilhard. Now, he didn't think of the environmental crisis the way we do. He's in a different age. He's in a different context. But let me conclude with a brief defense of Teilhard in this regard, drawing on his notion of duration. So I have more techno-pessimistic kinds of instincts than Teilhard seemed to possess. So sometimes I would like him to go a little more deeply in his critique of where the technology could be going. But on the other hand, I can see no way out of our current crisis if it does not include a new sense of the intrinsic link between humanity and the cosmos. And no one revived our sense of this link more powerfully and suggestively in the 20th century than Teilhard himself precisely with his understanding of duration and time. With respect to the cone of time and the development of the noosphere, he does not collapse levels of evolutionarily transformed speciation into one another, which allows for otherness and polarity and a kind of center to center union to be understood in his manner of thinking. But even more, his insistence that the cone of time establishes each thing as possessing a kind of necessity, even if it is not absolute, in the genesis of the world, leads ultimately to an understanding that each thing that stands before us reveals the whole in a unique and irreducible manner because necessary to the whole precisely when the thing is and not only where it is. You have a durational understanding of the part revealing the whole. This is a, it seems to me a powerful development in how we think about time and history and the world and our place in relation to all these factors. And I'm not sure that anyone ever drew this out the way he has done. Maybe so in those 19th century thinkers, maybe in the idealists of the romantics, but I find it comes out in a very powerful way, post-evolutionary thought, post-Darwinian evolutionary thought in Teilhard. So his durational philosophy and theology promotes verification at a deeper level than a one-sidedly spatial construct can do that everything possesses deep importance in relation to the totality of the cosmos precisely through its singular whenness and not only its whereness. It's time and not only its place, not that those things can be separated, but you can bring out the temporal dimension, the durational dimension better. Things do not get absorbed into the relational fabric of the cosmos, but are interdependent with the entirety of the whole, which depends upon them to be what it is. However, we cannot fully know the meaning of this interdependent open system of interconnectivity that is the cosmos and all its singular events in its total duration until the future is given to us. And that's what John Hott really focuses on in his books. I assume we'll hear something about this in the next talk. And I'm gonna bring this to conclusion now. Um, it seems to me that Teilhard's durational vision which includes the polarity element, where you have unity through difference, where there's otherness, where there's center to center union, where there's communion. I think this can help us to understand what Pope Francis is getting at when he says the message of each creature and the harmony of creation points to the fact that each creature has its own purpose. None is superfluous. If everything is woven together in the fabric of time and duration the way Teilhard understands it, we have a strong, powerful sense of the kind of necessity, not a deterministic necessity, but the kind of necessity of each thing for what it is. And this enables us to, it seems to me, see the integrity of each thing more clearly. And then the other thing I have 
highlighted here at the bottom of this passage from Pope Francis, the history of our friendship with God, he says, but I mean, he's talking about special places in our experience, but these special places are also special times. And so what I'm really getting at here in this talk is I think that Teilhard helps us to see in a new light these famous first four lines of William Blake's Auguries of Innocence that were probably read to all of us, or that we read at a young age. They've always been very powerful to me to see the whole and the part, but now understood in terms of the durational convergence of the universe and how everything is necessary for that development. It's a beautiful way, I think, of seeing the evolutionary development of the universe. I can't stand here today and defend it from a scientific perspective, but phenomenologically speaking, I think that what Teilhard has done with his durational understanding can really give us this powerful view of things again, how everything is interconnected in this polar unity. So that's how I'm going to end. I thank you for your time today. Yeah.